It's Thursday, April 9th. We're studying 2 Peter chapter 1. We've reached verse number 9, so let's take a look at the context here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5, you might remember, started with this reminder to make every effort. So this is about sanctification and our effort in it. Of course, God produces all of the outcome and bears the good fruit through us, but we're making every effort in this passage to supplement our faith. And we looked at all these virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Those were the things that we then said, if you have these, last time we got together yesterday, and uh, they're yours and increasing. So again, there's the effort, depending on our effort, depending on our depending on our progress, they keep you from being, and we looked at two things here yesterday, ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked a lot about the reality of faith and whether it's real or whether it's not. Well, today, let's take a look at this. There's another option here. Whoever lacks these qualities, so if these things are lacking, and again, the word qualities is not there in Greek, these, these things, they're not, there's no word to describe what they are that is given, but that's not a bad word here. These virtues, these qualities, these fruits that come out of the Christian life. And if you're lacking them, they're not what they ought to be. Then here's the thing. It's either that we're nearsighted, right? So nearsighted that you're blind. Uh, and this is helpful for us to think through. The idea of blindness is always a bad thing. And if it's a problem with our sight, we'll take a look at this in a second. Uh, well, then maybe we've forgotten uh, that we've been cleansed from our former sins. So that's what we're going to look at today. But notice where this goes. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and your election. So we need to be sure of it. And certainly in verse number eight, last time we got together, we looked at the fact that it could be false Uh, knowledge. And then yet in this passage, it looks like maybe there's something about the reality of the Christian life when these things are lacking, that uh, we've forgotten some things, that we're nearsighted. Okay, so this is important to remember. And I think the distinction between am I a real Christian, which we tried to deal with last time, and is there a real Christian life and then just something wrong or defective in my spiritual growth? I just want to remind you of the fact that so many in America say that they are Christians, but clearly have no fruit. I pulled a couple stats here together. I thought of one big uh, crusade up in Washington state, just the stats that help us understand how there are so many people that make decisions for Christ or they say they're in with Christ. In this case, there were 5,550 people that apparently were led to Christ, but only 23% were willing to do anything in response to that after this event was over, uh, this big uh, crusade, the stadium crusade. Or how about this? There was a big uh, evangelistic push in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, Just by way of example, 1,665 people they claimed were led to Christ. They're new Christians. Uh, More specific details now, only 14% of them would be willing to engage in a Bible study. And out of the 14% that got involved in it, only 6% actually finished it. And then only 3% ended up engaging in a Christian church, a Christian fellowship. So you take a look at people sometimes touting numbers about folks that have a knowledge of Christ. Even they say they've made some kind of profession of faith. Uh, The fruit of that, in many cases, is just not there. And if it's not there, then we can say, hey, we've got a real problem here with people thinking they're in with Christ when in reality they're not. But I think there's another option here in verse number nine. Uh, But let's start with blindness because we want to make the distinction. Take a look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, talking about blindness. If our gospel is veiled, if if people don't understand it at all, it's veiled to those who are perishing, non-Christians. In their case, the God of this world, notice the small g here on this, we're talking about the enemy of God, Satan here, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. So we're talking about non-Christians here, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now, so much of the New Testament is dealing with the problem of us acting like non-Christians when we are Christians. Of course, not in totality, but sometimes we fall into not seeing the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ to the extent that we should. And I think here in our passage, as we're dealing with verse number nine, if we're lacking these qualities, if we went through all of these things in this passage, again, remember what they were, uh, virtue, uh, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. If those things are lacking, and we could make a longer list, but those are the ones here in this God-breathed passage, then we know that there's uh, something defective if they're not where they ought to be. If we are not, as we looked at last time, that great passage in Hebrews 5, if we're not seeing the kind of progress in the amount of time where you should have ample time to see these things developed in your Christian life, well, then something's wrong. And what's wrong? Well, maybe it's not that we're blinded like a non-Christian who can't see any of this at all. 
control. But maybe we've lost track of the realities of those things the way that we ought to. The former book, 1 Corinthians, we quoted 2 Corinthians 4. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He speaks now to Christians and he calls them brothers. That's important. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. But as people of the flesh, that's an important concept. The idea of thinking, well, you're you're like people that are just governed by your fleshly desires. And and it's not that they're non-Christians, it's just that they're they're infants in Christ. And therefore, Paul kind of had to stoop in the things that he was teaching. I fed you milk, not solid food for you. We're not ready for it. That's what we looked at in Hebrews 5. If you can't digest more deep and, and involved truths from Scripture, maybe there's a problem with your maturity. Well, in this case, he says, uh, even now you're not ready. You got problems in your life. And he starts to uh, define that, saying you're you're still of the flesh or you're acting like you're non-Christians. And he says some things that shouldn't be there. There's jealousy, there's strife among you. And when that's there, he says, while that's there, are you not of the flesh? You're acting or behaving only in a human way. You're not acting like Christians. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? You're acting just in a fleshly, non-Christian way. So here are people, by the way, that are not characterized, as he goes on to say in this book, by these flagrant acts of disobedience. I mean, these are people that are saying, I'm of this preacher and I'm of that preacher. But still, there's jealousy, strife. There's things that are not developed in their Christian life the way that they ought to be. And he says something's lacking here. It's not that you're completely blinded to the glory of Christ or the light of the gospel, but there's something about your connection to the truth of Christ and the truths of the gospel that make it to where you're not producing these things the way that you ought. They're lacking. It's not that they're completely absent. And some of us going through this study, we think about the fact that these things aren't where they need to be. Maybe there was conviction each time we looked at a detail in this passage and said, I need more of that. It's not there. I don't have self-control, for instance, or I really don't have uh, the kind of brotherly affection that we talked about. That's not natural. It's not happening in my Christian life, and it's not where it ought to be. Well, the answer here in our passage is two things, right? Nearsightedness that starts to look like blinded blindedness. Maybe you're you're acting in the way that you shouldn't because your focus is nearsighted. Now, here's the analogy. You don't have your focus where it ought to be. And the Bible, and again, these are all analogies, but our, our eyesight so to speak. Our focus is not lifted up to where it ought to be, where Christ is seated. Now I'm quoting Colossians chapter 3. Our minds ought to be set on things above. Our perspective ought to be an eternal perspective. Nearsightedness is a good analogy to talk about the idea of I'm looking about the the temporal things here. I can't help but think about the next problem or the next challenge or the things at work or in our case this COVID-19 shelter at home order and I have all these concerns and problems about my bank account or my retirement fund. I'm just so focused on the things of this life that I don't have the focus where it ought to be. Now, remember, there are a lot of people like Judas or Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that love this present world. And you can see the near fieldedness of that word, present world, the here and now, the things right here. And Christians can be genuinely regenerate but they're not bearing fruit the way that they ought to. Maybe they're bearing fruit in a five-fold way and they ought to be in a 30 or 60-fold way. And because these fruits aren't really abounding in their lives, their tree is bearing fruit, but there's, there's puny fruit and there's not a lot of it on it, on that tree of the Christian life. Well, then maybe the focus is nearsighted. The, the, uh, the, the focus of our hearts, the concern of our minds keeps looking in the near field. And so this is about stretching us to a, a, a far perspective, a, an eternal perspective. Hebrews 11 is a great text that reminds us of that 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 reaching toward this eternal home. Our, our home is not here. We're exiles and strangers here. And God's not ashamed to call those people my people, right? Because, and, and, and to be known as the, you know, that these people have God as their God because they seek an eternal city, a, a city whose builder and found and, and architect is, is God. They look beyond the present life. And that's really what we need. We talk about it so much around here, but we need that eternal perspective to look beyond the present circumstances is always to something fixed on the horizon of eternity. And as some people have said, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And C.S. Lewis said it well, we're really no earthly good until we are heavenly minded. Real Christians cannot do the kinds of, of transcendent, eternally fruitful things in people's lives like evangelism and real discipleship until they get their focus stretched across the horizon. So 
it, it's important for us to realize that Christians can act like non-Christians. Colossians chapter 3, look at this passage. The idea, again, is that of I've got stuff that's in me that is focused here on the near field. It's earthly stuff. He talks about sexual immorality, impurity, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked. There's his word. I talk about that phrase, that, that Greek word, peripateo. Paul loved that. That's the manner of your life. That was the consistent manner of your life. When you were living in them, right? Christians are pulled out of that. They're, they're freed from all of that. He says, now you must put them all away. So there's effort involved in seeing these things go away. Anger and uh, wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Now look at the appeal here in the middle of verse 9. Seeing that you have put off the old self. I'm no longer who I was, and that old self had a bunch of practices with it, but you put on this new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. We've talked about this a few times in this series in 2 Peter 1, the idea of I am a new person in Christ. I need the knowledge, look at that passage there, the knowledge of the truth of Christ and the Bible, biblical data, to have that transformative effect in our lives. And it will look more and more like that divine nature in this passage in 2 Peter 1. Well, all of that here is basically Christians having to be told to act like Christians and don't keep acting like who you were. You didn't learn Christ in that way. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 17 big passage here. Well, maybe I ought to read the rest of where we have been here in our text. And because I want to read the whole of that sentence one more time in verse number nine, whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted, so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. You fail to live in light of the fact that you are out of that old place. You are no longer living in that. You no longer are seen as earthbound. You are now seated in heavenly places with Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 3, these ideas of you are now God's child. You're adopted into his family. So you got to start acting that way. You need to start thinking that way. You need to marshal the, the efforts of your mind to think in those terms. Again, I just want to repeat this because this is an oft neglected part of the way Christians understand their Christian life. So let's go to it now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, I say this and testify in the Lord, verse 17 that you must no longer walk. Again, there's our word. He loves that phrase. Say, the pattern of your life. Don't live that way as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Again, like this verse over my shoulder, the transformed mind. It, it, it is a transformed life that comes from a renewed mind. And, and so they're walking in the futility of their mind. They don't have the truth of the gospel. They're not meditating on it. They're not applying it. They are darkened in their understanding, in their understanding alienated from the life of God. They're not Christians because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. It's always an issue of the will, not just the mind. Having become callous and given themselves over to all these things, sensuality, greed, and impurity, those are the kinds of things that can be present uh, in the Christian's life because he fails to see who he is. Verse 20, but that is not the way you learn Christ. You're drawn out of that. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, you've got to think in those terms to put off your old self, Right? You, you've done that positionally, and now you need to start doing that in your, your mind, in the things that you're choosing to do, which belongs to your former manner of life. That's not the life that you have now. That's your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And that's the thing to be freed from that corruption that's in the world caused by sinful desires. That was the passage in 1 Peter that we looked at, and we're seeing less and less of that. Well, that means that I've got to start living like the person I am. And I've got to be, here it is again, renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the idea. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So my mind needs to be renewed. I need to think like the forgiven, adopted person that I am. I've got a fleshly encasement that makes that hard and a challenge. But i got to live this way. i got to think this way. And the passage says, if you lack these qualities, you got a problem. You're nearsighted. Focus long view and don't just keep thinking about this world and how to fulfill and gratify the desires of the flesh. You got to think about the fact that you were forgiven from all of that. These qualities, if they're yours and increasing, great. They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. If you lack them, nearsighted, so nearsighted that you're blind 
forgotten that you've been cleansed from your former sins. It's about a battle of our minds to think rightly. I hope this is a good challenge for us to rethink who we are, our identity in Christ every single day. Verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 1, get into verse 10 next time, and I hope you'll continue to comment and that you'll subscribe and not miss an episode of our study through 2 Peter.